Welcome, Silver, to our latest edition of Changemaker Insights. Really happy to have you here. Today, we're going to talk about you personally, but also about Shroomwell. Um, so really great to have you. And maybe starting off, would you like to give us a bit of an introduction to Shroomwell itself? What does it do? What's the organization about? Uh, it's about mushrooms. Uh, I think that's clear. But uh, what are the products it sells? What is the mission behind? What is the bigger vision that you have? Uh, thank you, Thomas. And uh, first of all, uh, very grateful for uh, for you to have me on this uh, podcast. I heard there are a uh, few big names before me who've been taking the stage, so I'm, I'm glad to be here with those names. But uh, I'll, I'll try to uh, not to disappoint. <laughs> Let's make this uh, interesting and fun. So uh, Shroomwell, uh, yes, the name implies it's uh, it's all about mushrooms. So the, the, how the name became to be is actually it's the mushroom and wellness. So Shroomwell. And we used to have a different name when the company was founded. And uh, we rebranded a bit over a year ago now. Uh, it was uh, Chaga Health. And as the name implies, we were very much into Chaga mushroom. So that was all we were doing, everything about Chaga. So the company got started in uh, 2014. So we're turning 10 this year. And uh, it started from the personal need. As always, the good products, they start from personal need. So the founder, it's the story actually goes back to like the 90s. So uh, our founder's grandma was diagnosed uh, stage four cancer. It was beginning of the 90s in Estonia. Mm -hmm. We just became free from Soviet Union. Things were hectic. And then, uh, yeah, diagnosed stage four cancer. And Basically, every professional in the field said, like, there's nothing we can do. You have weeks, mm -hmm. maybe months to live. And uh, when you lose hope, you're ready to try with whatever. And uh, they remembered that there is a very interesting kind of a potion uh, recipe uh, sitting in the, on the shelf. So they tried that. And uh, yeah, lo and behold, that was the, our original product, Chaga Elixir. So uh Time uh, lived another uh, 14 years, if I'm not mistaken, and didn't die because of cancer, but died because of the old age. But that was wow. in the 90s. That was in the 90s. So uh, the company didn't start it there yet. Um, the story repeated itself uh, with founders, a uh, good friend, same thing, stage four cancer. And they were like, already, okay, let's try this. And uh, originally, he was uh, literally uh, given weeks uh, to live, and he extended his lifespan uh, two and a half years. Uh, with Chaga. Uh, but for a person who has stage four cancer, two and a half years is uh, is a, mile a millennia, basically. So, and before uh, passing away, he, he literally said that, like, this is something that needs to go into the bigger world. Like, this this is something different. Like, so uh, Seem, the founder, uh, started a company called Chaga Health, and that was the original recipe. So uh, that was the original product that we started with in 2014. Being a small, uh, fluffy, cute company, when we first started, <laughs> we started to grow. And around 2017, 2018, we uh, added new products in the product line. Uh, we got our own production going. We became more professional. And then we realized at one point that if we keep on growing, if we keep on doing those things and keep on growing with the pace we are, there's not enough chaga to go around to harvest sustainably. So those who don't know, uh, chaga is a functional mushroom that grows in the forest on a live host tree. So you actually have to go around to find it. Uh, you have to spend time because you don't know exactly where it grows and so on. So it's not that easy, that simple. Uh, we start looking into uh, opportunities uh, to actually harvest and grow chaga. Mm -hmm. uh, there was only one company in the world at that time who was able to do that or who figured out kind of the way uh, how to do that. And uh, that company was in Finland. And we are located in Estonia, which is neighboring country. So uh, we went to kind of explore their business doings. Uh, we tried to figure out what they're doing and we tried to figure out what we can do better compared to them. And then we started uh, Chaga Farms from there. And with Chaga Farms, you, you need a live host tree. You need uh, birch trees for that. It's very expensive to go and buy, uh, buy off uh, forests to do the, the farming yourself. So we started to collaborate with the forest owners. And that was actually my first position as well when I joined the company to uh, actually collaborate the forest owners and expand the, the Chaga farms. When we were doing this, obviously we were looking at it from the spectrum of, 
we need Chaga because we have an end consumer product that we need to supply Chaga to. But when we were doing that business model, it became very clear that uh, we stumbled upon something very interesting, uh, which is a new, uh, completely new approach to the forestry because we offered forest owners income that they didn't have before without having to cut down their forest. Mm -hmm. Great. And uh, in some of the cases, the income is even larger or bigger than uh, cutting down the forest. So forest has been seen as a logging industry for thousands of years. That's the main value. And if you cut down the forest, you have a next revenue uh, stream in, what, 60 years? So it's a very long wait. And then we came in and we're like, okay, let's grow mushrooms together in the forest. And uh, you have a revenue flow for the next 20 years and you still have your forest left. And, wow. you know. People were like, "Okay, where's the catch?" Right? That that that's really cool. So that that means it originated from a, a personal need in the '90s and now evolved into a, a bigger company that um, actually combines two big things, right? So the one is health, um, improving the health of all our. Uh, people on this planet, at least the ones that take your products. So the health is is the one issue, but it seems like you have a very nature related way of doing business too, right? When it comes to yes. actually providing benefits to stakeholders like the people that own the forests, uh, where you actually make change uh, by pro by giving them alternatives um, and by actually generating more or less new forms of revenue for them. So it's a combination of different topics what you as an organization do correct that is correct and uh from there another business model came uh, came out where we're looking at okay if we have chaga if we can already offer uh, additional value to the forestry what else can we do like is there any other big kind of uh, issues environmental issues that we can fix using mushrooms and uh, we started to dig in and then uh, we found few big problems one of them being uh, uh, root rot which is a massive uh, problem, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, where it literally kills the trees inside out. And like, you can't really stop it because it uh, travels through the roots. And uh, we started to test out different mushroom uh, strains to see if we can uh, actually fight root rot. And uh, now we have a project. So I'm kind of like, like kind of running fastly through the entire process of last like five years, basically, right? Uh, basically, what happened, we found two strains that can fight with the root rot. At the same time, doing this project, uh, how to push out the root rot, we inoculate the trees with certain mushrooms that also have a fruiting body that are also extremely valuable as uh, wellness uh, functional mushrooms. So there is not only win-win, but there is win-win-win. Wow. And if you know what I mean. <laughs> and allow me, allow me to dig a little deeper here. I find this uh, this really fascinating because developing new business models um, requires a very holistic understanding of all of the different elements um, that are part of the business model. How do you approach this as an organization? I mean, you, you said, well, you looked at the problem side of things. What other problems are there when it comes to uh, sustainability in general or to to forestry? Um, but what else? I mean, that's most probably not enough to just discover problems uh, in terms of the organizational view on it. What do you do to discover these business models and then actually exploit on them and, and yeah, generate revenue out of problems that you discover? So we are kind of unique. We're, uh, uh, we call it a full circle company. So uh, we don't only manufacture, we also grow mushrooms. Uh, we, we have, we grow mushrooms, we harvest them, we produce them, we have our own brand. So we are a full circle company. So, uh, most of the decisions that we make today, we're also looking, uh, the other side of the business being like, okay, let's see if we're growing this mushroom, what kind of problems can this mushroom fix? And then use those mushrooms to put into end consumer products to go and fix the, I don't know, health crisis, for example. So we're looking at all of the spectrums of our business and see how that business model fits in there. So that literally means you come from the, the product, you come from the mushroom, and then you try to find application fields where the mushroom more or less can solve certain problems. Is that correct? So it's not necessary that, that you look for problems amongst your customers, but you rather look at the technology, parenthesis, which is the mushroom. So you look at the solution that you already have and you see which of uh, the problems that are out there can be solved by it. Yes, that's, uh, that's more or less right. 
obviously like we have tons of ideas like we've been throwing uh, a lot of ideas on the table being like okay what kind of environmental problems we have that we can fix with the uh, micro technology which is the mushroom technology there's 30 40 ideas on the table but then you eventually have to select the few that you're actually going to focus and work on and then we're trying to find the ones that have the most applications on every business aspect that we have that's great because it's it's more or less an access flip when it comes to it comes to innovation i mean what's what's usually very often propagated is start from the problem that customer has um and only look at the customer's problem customer centricity is key I'm not saying that you're not doing this but you're coming from the mushroom you come from your own internal offering and product that you already have which you grow yourself which you manufacture and then you can see which other problems can be solved by that i think it's a great approach See? We have a we have a slogan. There is a mushroom for every problem, and uh, that's I love that. And that's and that's a kind of a approach that we're having as well. Like this is how we're thinking. It's like okay, there are more problems in the world that we can uh, solve. So let's say if we are like thinking in a way that there is mushroom for every pro problem. If there is one mushroom, it has to solve at least three problems. If it solves at least minimum three problems, then we're going to take it on as a project. That's super great. There is a mushroom for every problem. I love that. Maybe speaking of your organization's philosophy, I mean, that that seems to be a part of it, almost like a defined virtue. There's uh, there's at least three problems that uh, one mushroom can solve. Um, but speaking of your organization, what is it that your organization maybe does different? What what makes your organization unique when it comes to running a business, when it comes to serving customers? Why why does your company stand out? What would you say as a CEO? Well, that's an excellent question. And obviously, we're very much, or I'm very much biased uh, answering that question. So uh, at least this is what we feel, what's different. I think the first thing is the approach inside out, the way that like if we select a, a product, a mushroom, a problem combined, it has to fix more than one problem. Right. So the, 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 the holistic solution has to fix more than one problem. So uh, that's one thing. The other thing is that um, we don't we're not afraid of like throwing ideas on the table. So uh, we, the founder is very uh, visionary. Uh, we have a lot of people in the company who are very visionary. So uh, we are rather throwing more ideas on the table than than less ideas. And then we're trying to really like select the best ones that really stand out. Uh, obviously, the, the work starts after you select the project and then making it happen and uh, making a real application out of it. That's that's a whole different story. Right. And we all have our problems in every organization make, making those things happen. But uh, I think what makes us unique is like being in the right place at the right time, acknowledging where we at, acknowledging uh, which direction the world uh, is moving to and then trying to fit in into that world by saying that, okay, there is a solution for minimum three problems here. So it serviced the forest owner, it serviced the, I don't know, governmental level, it serviced the end consumer product. And, like, and that I think is what makes us different. And also being the, the full circle. Yeah, cool. And speaking of visionary, you said uh, the founder is very visionary and many people in the organization are very visionary. Speaking of the the vision of, of, of Shroomwell, I mean, the the mission is to combine or to solve the health crisis and health problems with mushrooms, with a nature-based solution, right? Um, but what's the vision? How does the world of Shroomwell, specifically your world, and then maybe the world in general, serviced by your products and offerings look like in 10, 15 years from now? What is different? Um, what, what kind of difference has been brought to this world by, by your organization? The, the vision of the company is, can be defined very easily. It's uh, to better the humankind using mushroom technology and then looking for those opportunities. So being a human health or being the environment or something else. So like we're really working towards that. How the world is going to change, like what's going to change in 15 years us being around or what the world is going to miss if we're not around is, uh, first of all, I'm personally in charge of the Truma wellness side. And I can I can speak for that very uh, dearly because like this is the vision I'm driving for uh, towards the most. It's like if I'm making an average product, like the world doesn't need another average product. Like there is plenty of average products out there. If I'm gonna put something out there, it needs to stand out. It needs to have something that, that there has to be something that's made different compared to the every other product out there. 
And if it mm -hmm. doesn't tick the box, sorry, the product is no fit, right? And also, if we're looking all the other products or all, all the other uh, kind of a parts of the organization, it's uh, kind of easy because this is the field that is just emerging. So easy in <laughs> in a way, easy, right? It's like it's just emerging, but the technology, the mushroom technology, can offer so much uh, compared to every other technology that we have right now. So I'll just give you a quick example. So we, we live in a world of uh, pesticides. We live in a world of, uh, like, I would say, very artificial world, which down the road driving us toward uh, destruction. So uh, we're in a situation where, for example, uh, we're running out of certain commodities uh, that we've been mining or, or uh, digging out of the ground for like century now. And we're very dependent on it. One of them being a peat mod, for example. Mushrooms can offer alternative to that. So we're actually working with one of the solutions that we have. It's like we're working on the mix. We call it the mushroom carpet that has, I don't know, five, three to five different applications you can use it to solve uh, very big problems. One of them is being alternative for a peat mod. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's more effective than the peat mod itself is actually. So th the same rule applies. It's like, okay, if we come out with a certain technology, it has to fix not one, not two, minimum three big problems in the environment. That's great. And, and, and you specifically say in the environment and you specifically see your role uh, as the one that is responsible for um, making these products stand out, right? So you're the one that actually Absolutely. makes sure that these, uh, these products, these offerings, these solutions really solve not only one problem, but two uh, and at least three. Speaking of you personally, um, I mean, you say you're for your lifetime, you've been a dedicated biohacker. <laughs> Um, uh, could you could you give us a, a bit of an insight on what that specifically is? What is a dedicated biohacker? I love the word dedicated in there, but biohacker is certainly also interesting. Yeah, so let's start with the, the word biohacker first. So uh, I, I've been kind of exploring the, the biohacking world for 10 years now. Back in 2014, I used to live in, uh, in Canada, in Toronto, and I started to hear from different podcasts, I started to hear the word biohacking, and I was like, Biohacking is kind of bettering yourself. I didn't really know exactly what it is, but uh, being an entrepreneur, the most valuable asset uh, you have is your brain. Like you can lose your hands, you can lose your legs, like you can still operate. Brain is something that uh, makes things happen, right? And uh, I was living in a constant brain fog, like constant brain fog. Having like seven coffees a day, uh, you know, trying to survive, pushing things forward. Like, and then I was like, I, I, I need, I need a better flow. Like I need to be easier than that. And uh, biohacking was kind of the way uh, for me uh, to become way more effective and uh, active. And then this is where I deep dive in. So what is biohacking? Biohacking is being in control uh, of your environment around you and inside of yourself to be more effective. So what if you can, ex uh, you can expand your brain potential 10%, 20%? Like... Can you imagine the impact, like what you can do? Like, and that was my question in my head. And this is where my story started as a biohacker. Great. And maybe transferring to the other word, dedicated, because we're asking, <laughs> uh, we're asking all our learners uh, in the very first challenge, for example, to come up with their personal mission, right? And uh, in all of the podcasts I had, people speak of their conviction, their personal mission, uh, whatever gives them energy is their passion, their purpose. Um, so is biohacking uh, what you've what you stand up for every day? What, what's your personal mission? I mean, there's most probably more things than biohacking, but would you be able to, to let us know? Yeah, so the word, what the dedicated means in this case is, um, so there's an 80-20 rule, I would say, like in everything in life. So you do 20% of things, you get 80% of the result. So uh, that would be, you know, biohacking uh, at itself. Now, the rest of 20%, uh, to achieve the rest of 20%, you have to put the 80% effort in. And most of the people don't want to do that and they don't even need to do that uh, because it becomes either too expensive, too, too time-consuming, uh, whatever it is. I'm kind of a freak in that sense. Like I want to push the boundaries and understand like what else I can do. 
like I'm willing to go the extra mile. So like I've been trying, like if I, I listen a lot of biohacking podcasts, I, I read a lot of books, like I try to keep myself uh, informed as much as possible and up to date. I've been doing crazy things like uh, injecting certain things into my body to see the results and like stuff like that. So like I always say that if my mom would hear everything that I've done, like she would probably panic and call me and be like, stop killing yourself. But I don't <laughs> see the world this way. So some of the things that I've done uh, uh, illegal in the way where it's like like medicinal world says that you can't do this. But by the end of the day, I'm like, it's my body. It's my decision. And uh, I'm, I haven't done anything illegal in a way, like uh, injecting some heavy hardcore drugs. I'm, I'm talking about simple things that most people don't even know that you can do that and it gives you an age. So that's what I say is, is dedicated. It's like going to extra mile and be like, hey, this is interesting. Let me try this. That's 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 brilliant. I immediately had to think of Alexander von Humboldt. I don't know if you, if you know who, who who traveled the world and uh, and it, it was in the jungle and was trying to do everything just for the sake of understanding, for the sake of his own curiosity, for the sake of uh, helping them the world with his insights. So I think that's yeah. uh, that's a brilliant approach. Um, and sp speaking of the connection to the dedicated biohacker, which is you, so you're very much into health, you're very much into biohacking. How did you connect this to the organization which you're now leading? Um, how, how did this connection happen and uh, how does it help you now? I mean, most probably there's a very, very strong alignment when it comes to the mission of the organization and your personal mission, the values of the organization and your personal val values. Otherwise, you wouldn't be the CEO leading the entire company, right? Well, it's it's directly connected. Um, like in any any business, If you don't understand the business, if you don't understand the core nature of your business and consumers, uh, it's very difficult to make uh, good decisions and right decisions for the consumer. If uh, we're talking about uh, mushroom and wellness, well, you need to understand your uh, customers, they're humans, and you need to understand their needs and how their body is operating so you can give them the best advice. What I love about mushrooms, and I found my way into the mushrooms uh, 20 around 2018, 2019, like 2019, I was already deep diving in, but 2018 was where it uh, became on my uh, radar. And I'm like, this is going to be an XP thing. Like I just had that feeling. And uh, the more I learn about the mushroom and the more information uh, comes to light about mushroom, I'm convinced that the mushroom are going to be the most powerful thing in a human existence that we ignored for like, I don't know, hundreds of years now. So uh, it used to be a core uh, in our society, in our uh, human nature for like thousands of years. And then we lost it somewhere. And let me tell you why. So on a DNA level, we are much more closer to mushrooms than we are to plants or any other animals. Yeah. We share 50% over 50% of our DNA with mushrooms. And that itself already uh, puts mushrooms in a pedestal and in a position where like anything we consume is much more bioavailable and much more bioactive than anything else. Knowing and understanding that helps obviously me to design products and understand our customers. For a beginner like me, maybe a little detour because we we spoke already about you. But for a, for a beginner like me, um, since you're saying this is going to transform the world, uh, and if we uncover more of it, this will benefit us all. Um, but what is it that you would recommend to dive a little deeper into the topic of mushroom business um, and mushroom businesses? Is there any recommendation that you have for all the listeners, including me? Oh, absolutely! I think the best uh, spent hour, hour and a half, uh, go to next week, Netflix and uh, search for uh, Fantastic Fungi. Ah, I've seen that, yeah. I, I've uh, seen right? That, yeah. So, so uh, it's done by Paul Stamets, who's kind of the forefather of uh, functional mushrooms. Like he's been in the, in the field, in the business for like 50, 60 years now. So he's the one who uh, popularized this field. And he's the one who spent uh, tens of millions of dollars uh, up to date uh, to kind of investigate it further. I think that's a good segue or that's a good uh, way into the mushroom. 
great. Um, coming back to you, to you personally, uh, and maybe also be very connected to the world of uh, of mushrooms in itself. But is there a leader out there in this world? Is there in um, an organization? Is there a business that you look up to where you say, "Wow, they really understood it. They've built they've built an organization which is unique. They've uh, have established a culture which uh, I would love to see at my company too." Any names that you could give us? Yeah, obviously, like there are uh, uh, there are many companies, like some of them, like being closer to to us uh, here in Estonia or in the region, and some of them, you know, further some of the big companies. Um, one of the companies I I would love to kind of uh, mention, uh, and you you guys probably know it, uh, is uh, Mind Valley. Mind so. Valley. The, Yeah, the founder of Mind Valley, uh, Vishen Lakiani, is actually uh, also an uh, investor in our company. He currently still lives in Estonia. And uh, the way he has built up his organization and the way he's uh, operating that organization, in my eyes, is mind blowing. The dedication that people have, the communication that people have in the organization, the way that uh, decisions are made and how fast the decisions are made and everything. I would love to be there one day. Nice. And what is it specifically that inspires you? Uh, it, leadership principles, the culture that he's built, and what are you trying to do likewise? I personally believe that, so there are a few things uh, or two things I strongly believe. So one is uh, Humanity Plus uh, concept. Humanity Plus means that your organization gives more to the humanity than it actually takes out of the humanity. So like, let me just uh, give you an example. So hedge funds, they're not humanity plus. Like they actually consume more from the humanity than they give back. Coca-Cola, in my eyes, not a humanity plus because they make money selling uh, highly uh, fructose uh, water that uh, destroys human health. And they make a lot of money doing that. These are examples of not a very good humanity plus companies. And then there is a humanity plus companies who are like bettering humankind, making sure that uh, the return that they're giving back to the humanity is minimum 10x, tenfold. And uh, what I love about uh, Mind Valley is this is exactly what they do. That's one thing. So they're always thinking, I was like, okay, if I'm putting something out there, sure, I'm making money, but that's a side product. I'm actually making uh, tens or hundreds or thousands of uh, lives better through that. And the other thing that I really admire, it's every business doesn't matter how many people you have in a business, two or 200 or 2,000. Business is all about people. It's a relationship of people. So how you uh, uh, see your organization, your people, and how you respect them and how you talk to them and how you make decisions, how you uh, – basically how you respect them is, is everything. And uh, when I'm looking at this organization aside, from the sidelines, I'm like, okay, this is – They, I wouldn't say they perfectioned it, but they're uh, very close to that. Mm -hmm. How you treat each other, right? So that that's how you define how the culture is, how people treat each other. Absolutely. So, nice. Uh, and I love the Humanity Plus concept. Yeah, that's a great one. Sometimes not too easy to, to have it in all dimensions, right? So uh, it, 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 also practically, practically every little decision you would need to question, is that a human, Humanity Plus decision? Like, are we giving more than we're taking? Um But I think it, like overall, it's a really, really great mantra of value to have and then pinning down or also like trying to measure all of your action against it, right? Yeah. yeah. And also there is another thing is like there is a reality, right? There is a uh, economical uh, things. There is like everything around us that makes that humanity plus so much harder. And like sometimes you have to make tough decisions, but keeping that in mind, you do your best to keep your line. So Yes. Yes, totally. Maybe to to leave the audience, um, and I know this is very hard, but uh, maybe to leave the audience with uh, an advice from yours that you have personally gained a lot from uh, in the uh, in the last years. But if you were to pin it down to one single advice, and imagine um, it's the Change Maker Insights podcast, so it's about making change. Uh, as a human. Um, so all of our listeners are trying to save the world. Not necessarily everyone is trying to save it big time with an organization or it's like her or his own venture. Maybe it's also the small actions. It's the small projects. It's the little steps. It's the baby steps. 
But what is it that you would give everyone as an advice, one single advice in becoming a change maker, being better at a change, at change making, anything that comes to mind is really important and has helped you? Entrepreneurship is a constant development of yourself, right? And uh, it's a constant learning. But I think the biggest learning for me for the last, let's say, 10, 15 years has been that it's okay to be vulnerable. And yes. you have to be vulnerable because that what makes you a human being. Humans don't respect you less because of that. They respect you more. It also gives you the opportunity that you can actually start to relate with other human beings. And they want to talk to you and they want to help you. So uh, we have to lose. I know it's slowly fading away and maybe some, t some cases we're going too much extreme on the other end. But uh, we have to lose the, this macho mentality where it's like, uh, you know, nothing can break me, rah, rah, rah. Like, uh, I'll take, just bring it on, like throw whatever you have at me and like, I'll, I'll just take it, everything on. It's like, we're human beings. Like nobody's uh, that tough. Like we all break down sometimes. And uh, your people, whoever those your people is, is this your organization, your friends, your family, or, or anybody else you're communicating to, they need to know you're a human being. Like they need to know so they can relate and they're like, oh, you're vulnerable. You're a human being. I can relate. Let me help you. How can I help you? And next time they can come to you and be like, listen, I have a problem now. Can you help me? And that what makes a human connection uh, true, I would say. That's powerful. I grew up uh, in a world where I was told um, in the business world, if you show emotion, you're a loser. Um, yes. But there's so much more than our cognitive capacities. There's those emotional capacities. We have emotions. There's no sense in, in hiding them. There is no sense. I, so I, I, I wholeheartedly agree <laughs> and uh, <laughs> would definitely sign what you just said. Showing vulnerability is one of the core competencies and being able and being strong to show that core competencies of the 21st century. Listen, I, I grew up in the Soviet Union showing vulnerability, especially if one generation up, like my, my, my parents, like uh, that was close to death sentence. We have the wall up that takes time uh, to kind of like demolish down, but acknowledging it and understanding that this is a humane uh, or human emotion and this is okay i think that's the first uh, first step towards healing <laughs> totally and you somehow sneaked in a second advice which you said you need to be a lifelong learner uh, which of course also speaks to my heart because we're a university and it's about lifelong learning i don't believe or we don't believe in this threefoldedness of life first you educate then you work and then you retire It's about lifelong learning. Um, and I think you're a brilliant example for that, just the way how you lead and build the business by constantly exploring new problems and using mushrooms to solve it. So to me, you're a real change maker. Can I just yeah. add one more thing to that lifelong Please. learner? We, we don't live in the 50s anymore. So uh, we still t try to sometimes idealize the, the life that we had in the 50s and 60s, but we don't live there anymore. If you don't learn, if you don't constantly upgrade yourself, Uh, you're going to be obsolete. And uh, especially these, this day, uh, in this age, it's like you constantly, whatever you know today is almost obsolete tomorrow. So if you don't learn, and the, listen, this comes from a guy who didn't believe in the books. <laughs> this is how sad it was for me. So when I started to pick up books and I started to learn and I, I discovered the, the power of like the knowledge, like there was no looking back. But uh, especially for this day, uh, this age, like if you don't upgrade, constantly upgrade yourself, you, sorry, you're going to be obsolete. Yes, wonderful. I mean, uncover your inner self constantly, uh, your inner strength. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a journey. It's a process and it's definitely not a destination. Absolutely. That's a wonderful last statement. Thank you very much, Silva, for joining this episode on Changemaker Insights. So you're definitely a real change maker, and I'm curious to follow you in the next couple of months and years to see if your vision unfolds i'm sure many parts of it will unfold and the pathway will definitely be exciting i'm sure thank you thomas and thanks for having me <laughs>